today's game will be my 2000th game with the Yankees. I've been very nervous on this ballpark many times in the last 15 years, but never any more nervous than I am right now. Two balls, no strikes on Roger Maris. Here's the windup. Fastball hit deep to right. things go along in sports, you know, as days and years go by, us older fellas, we have to take a side seat to let the younger blood come in and take our places. You can't go on forever in sports. No, nothing goes on forever in sports, not even the great Babe Ruth. But the tradition he helped found, the spirit he and his teammates helped engender, has endured for 50 years thriving and growing in the house he's credited with building. Throughout the sports world, when someone refers to the stadium, chances are good he means that sports palace in the Bronx, Yankee Stadium. 50 years old this spring. This is our tribute to those 50 years with some of the men who live them. The stadium. Years of gold. The Stadium Years of Gold, brought to you by Empire Ford, conveniently located on Sanford Boulevard at Fulton Avenue, just off the Hutchison River Parkway in Mount Vernon. 1923, Americans were dancing to a new song, a 1923 hit called The Charleston. Some of the other new songs that made it big that year were Mexicali Rose, Sugar Blues, Linger a While, Barney Google, Last Night on the Back Porch, and that all-time great, Yes, We Have No Bananas. Later in the year, an obscure Austrian named Adolf Hitler would stage a beer hall putsch in Munich. An outlaw named Pancho Villa would be assassinated in Mexico. And Willa Cather would win a Pulitzer Prize for fiction. In April, as the Major Leagues prepared for the 1923 baseball season, Warren G. Harding was President of the United States. But he would not live out the season. In New York, Lee DeForest was exhibiting the first sound on film, Talking Pictures, a series of vaudeville shorts at the Rivoli Theater. But baseball fans were more interested in the construction of a new edifice in the Bronx, a stadium that would house New York's other team. The American League entry, once known as the Highlanders, now the Yankees, who share the polo grounds with the better established New York Giants. Wade Hoyt, now a broadcaster for the Cincinnati Reds, was there, wearing the Yankee pinstripes when the stadium opened on April 18th, 1923. We opened the stadium, and of course Bob Shockey, who is now sick and can't be here tonight, mm -hmm. pitched the first game and beat the Red Sox 4-1, to and Dave Ruth hit a home run. And some amusing incidents occurred that year because of the fact that when we opened the stadium, the uh, stadium infield and outfield grass looked like a uh, like a billiard table or a, or, a, or a golf green. And then they rented it out to a rodeo, mm -hmm. and they put mats all over it to protect the grass. When they took the mats up, there wasn't any grass left, so they had to rese they had to uh, resod the whole thing. Mm -hmm. The, uh, another thing that people should re don't recall, these people today don't recall it at all, uh, when that right field pavilion at the Yankee Stadium, which extends in the right field and where line drives are sometimes hit over the head of the right fielders, that wasn't there, you know, back in the early days. I didn't know that. Why, certainly, that was built late. That wasn't built till the, oh, I don't know when it was built. What was there? The bleachers extended around that far and up the grade. You had to hit a longer ball, a different type of a ball to hit a home run then. Uh -huh. So when they say that uh, Ruth hit balls in there, Ruth, that wasn't there when Ruth was playing. So this gets to be a little bit ridiculous. I mean, some of these comparisons. I lived up in Edgecombe Avenue. I could, I could, uh, from my apartment up in Edgecombe Avenue, I could look down over the top of the polo grounds uh, uh, on the playing field. We used to walk down the uh, walk over. Then later, I lived over Riverside Drive and used to walk over from Riverside Drive to the Polo Ground. The New York Times reported that 74,000 people saw the Yankees beat the Red Sox that day. Appropriately, Babe Ruth acquired by the Yankees for $100,000 and a cash loan at the end of the 1919 season, homered as the Yankees won 4-1. to one. Frank Rossetti, whose days as a Yankee player and coach spanned 36 years, 
remembers the babe. At that time, he was really the only uh, home run hitter that there was in the major leagues, you know. And every time that he went to bat, I heard him say this, that every time he went to bat, he tried to hit a home run. Because he knew that the fans came out to see him to hit a home run. And that's why he struck out so many times. You know, he swung so hard. And even though when he would strike out, I mean, I'm telling you, he really whipped the air, you know. And the fans, he, when he would strike out, they even got such a big thrill out of him striking out that he, they let out a whoop because he swung, you know, he swung so hard. But he was really colorful in the things that he did. And uh, I don't know, he just stood out every time he, he hit a ball, so it'd go up high and far. Yankee Stadium was nine years old when Frank Rossetti donned his pinstripes. Of course, I was uh, awestruck by the big, uh, you know, the massive uh, structure and everything. And being only a kid, of course, probably, uh, and then with the, being with Babe Ruth, which, uh, which was another thing, you know, such a great player as Babe, home run hitter. Gordon Gehrig and uh, Lazari and uh, Earl Combs and Ben Chapman, you know, so many great ball players. And of course, I was only, a, a, you know, a young rookie. Babe Ruth retired from baseball, no longer a Yankee, in 1935. As things go along in sports, you know, as days and years go by, us older fellas, we have to take a side seat to let the younger blood come in and take our places. You can't go on forever in sports. But the scene was set for greatness. Lefty Gomez remembers. It was 38, and we were playing the Giants, and uh, I had the bases loaded, which wasn't unusual. And, and uh, of course, airplanes weren't that common in 1938, and and uh, this airplane flew over, so I backed off the mound watching him because he was pretty low, and, and everybody was upset. And uh, I know Joe McCarthy said that the, the batter could have hit a home run. I wasn't paying attention, but that was impossible to hit a home run because I had the ball in my hand. Right. And, uh, <laughs> that's what I told him. I said, if, if anybody can hit a ball a home run off of me before I throw the ball, you better get me out of there because that's going to be too tough a game for me. To those old enough to remember, one event stands out among all the exciting, moving, historic events of Yankee Stadium's 50 years. Over and over, those who were there cited as the most memorable event, the farewell tribute to Lou Gehrig on July 4th, 1939. It was deeply uh, moving for him and for everybody concerned, I guess. I've heard, I still hear about it. There must have been 150,000 at that stadium that day um, because everyone that talks to me says they were there, you know. Mm. But that's kind of the amusing part of it, but it was filled to capacity. Today, I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. Mrs. Garrig recalls her husband's feeling for the stadium where he played. Well, he loved the old joint, I know that. My God, yes, of course he did. He loved the place and wanted to see a ball go out of the stadium one day. They all did. They were all shooting for that. Uh, Babe Ruth, Mantle, Joe DiMaggio, none has ever gone out the stadium, you know. Year in and year out, the greatness of the Yankees continued, and the legend of Yankee Stadium grew. To each athlete who played there, the stadium had its own meaning. And the most brings back a special memory. Old reliable Tommy Henry. It happened in uh, 1942. I, I'm, I was going to go in the Coast Guard. In other words, I'd been tagged and I had to serve my country. And uh, it was a sunny afternoon, the last, about the last of August of 1942. And on, I had told Joe McCarthy that I had to leave. And uh, because they had to get a ball player ready for the World Series, and they had to get him before the first of September. So. We're playing Detroit, and in the uh, seventh inning of the uh, second game, uh, my, the public address announcer said, from out of the blue to me now, believe me, he says, ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, this will be Tom Hendricks' last appearance in a Yankee uniform for the duration of the war. And that people just applauded like crazy. So, you know, the people are really good if you give, a, give them a chance to be that way. <laughs> so, I... 
I stood there very embarrassed. I took my cap, and after about 10 seconds, I says, uh, come on, Dizzy Trout is a pitcher for the Tigers. I said, let's go. And old Diz stood and looked at me. He says, no, you don't, Tom. He says, this happens once in a lifetime. He says, enjoy it. So I did. So after, I don't know how long, 30, 40 seconds, I said, come on, let's play ball. So now I figured, well, I'll hit one to the moon for these people in appreciation, you see. So... I took two swings, and the count got to three and two. I haven't hit anything yet. And I said, never mind hitting one of the moon. Hit on someplace, you know. I hit the ball someplace. So the sixth pitch was uh, in the middle, and I hit a line drive to center field. And I'll say this, uh, Dizzy Trout uh, gave me six fastballs, and that's the one pitch I could hit. So he was a pretty good gent in my, in my mind. And uh, they, I never forget Yankee Stadium's fans from that moment to right now. I would say that's tops for me. Vic Rashi. The most outstanding uh, moment in the stadium, of course, came in 1949 uh, when uh, we played the Boston Red Sox for the championship uh, of that year to see who was going to get in the World Series. Uh, we uh, defeated them uh, in the first game of the two-game series, and then I pitched the last game and started, and uh, we had a one-to-one, one-to-nothing uh, ball game going into the last of the days where we uh, came up with four runs uh, to go ahead. And into the ninth inning, uh, the uh, Boston Red Sox came up with three, and uh, we finally beat them uh, in the last day, uh, five to three, to take the uh, championship. That was the most memorable moment uh, in, that I can remember uh, in the uh, stadium. Johnny Mize. We were playing the Browns, and uh, um, I think Dwayne Follett was the pitcher, Follett, and... Uh, uh, we just come off a road trip. It seems like we've won about 15 or 16 straight. And we needed a few more to break the record. Some, but anyway, we lost the round that night. I finished it, got a base hit, uh, which was my 2000. I, I drove in the only run. I think we scored in the ball game. So uh, that's one of the memories. Uh, another one is probably uh, joining the ball club, and then the. Uh, I hurt my arm and couldn't play, but I couldn't be hit, and uh, that was in 49. And then getting into the first World Series after <clears throat> being in the league since uh, 36 to uh, 49 without ever being in the World Series, which is quite a thrill when they beat Boston on the last day of the season. The Super Chief, Allie Reynolds. Uh, having come from Oklahoma, it was way beyond what I could expect. I just didn't really know what to look forward uh, to. Uh, I'd seen pictures of it, of course, but uh, to be in it actually um, was more, much more impressive, I think. It was much larger than even I could uh, anticipate. This is Phil Rizzuto. You know, I've got to figure I'm one of the luckiest guys in the world to have played for the New York Yankees for so many years. It was a thrill for me just putting on a Yankee uniform every day, and looking down and seeing that NY on my shirt, then going out in the field and looking at that tremendous ballpark. Then when the crowd started to fill the stands, I got a feeling I was so small I wanted to crawl into a hole. To have played with so many great ball players like Joe DiMaggio, Joe Gordon, Mickey Mantle, Yogi Berra, Bill Dickey, and Red Ruffing, to name a few. You know, when you have great ball players playing alongside of you, it makes you play so much harder. I'll never forget the first game I played in the Yankee uniform. I was so nervous that I had made up my mind to swing at the first pitch no matter where it was. I think the pitcher threw a knuckleball that was in the dirt. Anyway, I grounded out to shortstop. I was never so happy in my life to get back to the bench. Whenever the list of Yankee greats is read, it's headed by four names. Ruth, Gehrig, of course, and two men who prowl the depths of center field. Frankie Crosetti remembers one. The margin was probably... The greatest player that I saw with the Yankees, you know, that is overall, everything. Well, I've taken everything, hitting, fielding, base running, all that. And I don't, well, he was so, uh, he was so great in a way that he was, uh, he made things look easy, like in the outfield. The greatest of catches, uh, he made them look easy. Where another outfielder, well, would go and run, run, run hard, and then they'd probably make a spectacular catch and look, look great. But the man would make that same play look easy. He had such a great gift, uh, baseball instinct, what you want to call it, judgment. You get a great jump on a ball, and he had tremendous speed, more speed than the people realized. He took those long strides. And he was a great base runner. I don't think, I don't remember when he was ever thrown out trying to take an extra base. 
And he had a good arm, in fact, a great arm until he hurt it. And he was uh, really a winner, and it was a good hitter with, with men on bases. And all in all, he was, uh, other than taking and everything, I think he was the best. Thank you, Commissioner, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. This is a happy day for me. I'm very happy to be put alongside of Lou Gehrig and next another teammate, Bill Dickey, and with the rest of the old-time Hall of Famers and the President. I would like to say to Joe McCarthy, thanks for my early training in baseball. And now, ladies and gentlemen, may I say, the last chapter has been written, and I can now close the book. Ruth Gehrig DiMaggio and Mickey Mantle. Today's game will be my 2,000th game with the Yankees. I've been very nervous on this ballpark many times in the last 15 years, but never any more nervous than I am right now. As you all know, all the donations for this day are turned over to the Hodgkin's Disease Fund at St. Vincent's Hospital. That was founded in the memory of my father who died of Hodgkin's disease. I wish he could have been here today. I know he would be just as proud and happy of what you all have done here as we are. There's been a lot written in the last few years about the pain that I've played with. But I want you to know when one of you fans, whether it's in New York or anywhere in the country, say, hi, Mick, how you feeling or how's your legs? It certainly makes it all worth it. I just wish I had 15 more years with you. Thank you very much. And there are memories of great moments in Yankee Stadium that were shared by all of us at the park or listening to the radio. Here comes Roger Maris. Just standing up, waiting to see if Maris is going to hit number 61. Here's the windup. The pitch to Roger, way outside, ball one. And the fans are starting to boo. Low ball two. That one was in the dirt. And the boos get louder. Two balls, no strikes on Roger Maris. Here's the windup. Fastball hit deep to right. And the old professor, Casey Stengel. I would have to say the first time that the New York Yankees win the pennant in 1949, when we played the Boston Red Sox the last two games of the playing season. And a ball was hit naturally out to right field, and we caught a man going into the home plate, and we ended up as the victors, and I believe I was more excited because of my first World Series that I had been accustomed to get into to see if I could go on and make a record. Hello there, everybody. This is Mel Allen speaking to you from Yankee Stadium. Every kid uh, used to think of uh, baseball in terms of Babe Ruth. And all of a sudden, one day, as the years went by, I found myself in Yankee Stadium. And goose pimples came on me. And uh, I learned that that was no exception, that even football players, the pro football players, when they first come up and go into Yankee Stadium, they get goose pimples. Mel Allen saw and described a lot of action at Yankee Stadium, and from a lot of great memories, it's not easy to select the most outstanding. The last two games of the year, 1949, to come from one game behind Boston, to beat him out for the pennant at the Yankee Stadium. Um, I would suppose, and then there was the perfect game of uh, Larson, uh, 
Bob Feller pitching a no-hitter against the Yankees, and the last three men he had to retire in the ninth inning were Henrik DiMaggio and Keller. Uh, a ground ball triple play, three men being uh, run down on a base pass. A lot of, of course, that's an oddity. But uh, Maris' 61st homer, uh, which broke Babe's record, all those 162 games. But I would say Joe DiMaggio hitting in 56 straight games. Because to me, that's one of the all-time great individual uh, performances in any sport. Summer belonged to baseball, but the stadium has been a place for all seasons. And until this year, the home of the football giants. Charlie Connolly had played with the Giants for eight years in the Polo Grounds before they moved to Yankee Stadium. I guess the, the first big thrill was when we beat Chicago real badly. Uh, I think it's 48 to 13 for the World Championship in 56, but the 58 uh, game was quite a game, even though we lost it to Baltimore and New York. As you probably know, and the fans who remember the game, we, we had them down with about two minutes to go, and the United States brought them, I believe, 80-something yards to get a tie, and then... It seemed like after they got the tie, we just uh, we had the ball one time, and then they got the, came in and made the touchdown. But uh, we were very disappointed. But I think all the jobs, uh, well, we thought we'd won. And then, uh, as you know, it's not over to the last minute. But uh, we were very happy and uh, very fortunate to be in a game like that. Another giant great, Andy Robustelli, has a different memory of Yankee Stadium. I do know this, that, uh, that every Sunday that I stood at the sidelines and as they raised the flag in center field and then as everyone sang the Star Spangled Banner, I think that if I had to say that there was one single thrill that I had in sports, I would say that that was the single most important thing that I, I kind of cherish and, and, and continue to think about whenever I'm in the Yankee Stadium and whenever I hear the Star Spangled Banner or whenever I think of the Yankee Stadium. I think the second thing that I remember most about the Yankee Stadium is, is standing again on the sidelines with with tears in my eyes along with a lot of other ball players when we were playing the St. Louis Cardinals the Sunday after John Kennedy was, was killed in Dallas. And I, I think that we all stood there with mixed emotions because, you know, we didn't know whether or not we should be playing on the Sunday following or the Sunday that the president was, was laid out in Washington. And, and I think that, you know, everyone had mixed, mixed feelings. I, uh, I kind of feel, uh, or I felt that, uh, you know, you had to do your duty, and the commissioner said you should play, and uh, we were there. And uh, it, it was kind of a strange feeling. Uh, and I think that those are the two, the two things that I most remember about the Yankee Stadium. And there have been many more golden moments in the stadium's golden years. Championship fights involving Joe Lewis, Gene Tunney, Sugar Ray Robinson, Rocky Marciano, Floyd Patterson. College football, soccer, and outside the world of sports, a Billy Graham crusade, annual conventions of Jehovah Witnesses, amassed by Pope Paul VI before 80,000 people. 50 golden years since the first Babe Ruth home run. And at the end of this season, a new set of Yankee owners will take their team out of the stadium, but only temporarily. They'll soon be returning to the house that Ruth built. Yankee President Mike Burke. 1973, being the 50th anniversary of the stadium, uh, is also coincidentally, uh, you know, the final year that the stadium will look just exactly like it looks now. Uh, we leave at the end of the season, go a couple of years to Shea, and then when we come back in here in the, in the spring of 1976, uh, Yankee Stadium will hopefully have the same identity, the same kind of personality, the same chemistry that it's had for the past 50 years. But everything will be new. There will be new seats, new lights, new sound, new restaurants, uh, new everything. So it will have all of the creature comforts uh, of, uh, of the most modern stadium in the world. And, of course, the major uh, physical change will be that the, the pillars will be removed and so that there will be 60,000 unobstructed views of the field. And then, of course, all, all around the stadium, uh, there'll be vast improvement as well. Uh, uh, parking will be four or five times what it is now. Uh, and then to support that parking, there'll be new 
roadways around the stadium, uh, three, or three new ramps off the Deacon Highway leading into the new parking area, a whole new road system, in effect, that will make it easier for people to come and go. Uh, and then, uh, overall, there will be uh, new uh, landscaping and lighting covering a vast area of uh, 25 or 30 acres around the stadium. Uh, so that you will have the feeling of, uh, of uh, kind of an island, a park uh, in the Bronx, um, of which Yankee Stadium itself is, is kind of the center. So we'll have a kind of green area of shrubs and trees and flowers and uh, lights and uh, in the middle of it, uh, the Yankee Stadium. So it'll be a quite a dramatic and very attractive place for us to live and play and to win a lot of ball games. The engineers tell us that this, this uh, building is, is uh, very, very, very sound in its basics. Um, so that relatively little has to be done to the, to the basic structure. Uh, but um, it's just strong enough to, with these uh, renovations that are going to take place uh, to last uh, another 50 years. The Stadium, Years of Gold, written by Ken Fairchild. Produced by Arthur Gayen and Ken Fairchild, engineer William Callahan. I'm John Sterling, WMCA Sports. A stadium years of gold, brought to you by Empire Ford. Conveniently located on Sanford Boulevard at Fulton Avenue, just off the Hutchinson River Parkway in Mount Vernon. Say, would you like to spend a comfortable half hour with the children? I'd recommend that you take them to a Carvel ice cream store and ask the owner to show them how Carvel ice cream is made. Yes, I said an ice cream store. It's the Carvel new Carvel ice cream supermarkets where they make all their own ice cream products. And I'm sure the children will appreciate it. While you're giving the children an education, I have a recommendation for you. You try to determine the age of the Carvel product that you're buying. You'll find that it's fresh. You'll find that it's premium quality and that it's made on the premises. It is not commercial ice cream. You'll find that you can get a custom decorated ice cream cake to your specific specifications while you wait. Now that's a great education for children from the age of 5 to 65.